Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There you go, right down there. If you wanna be among the first to hear my weekly takes, NFL, college football, more, right there. So this is our Easter edition. I spent this morning with my daughter, and uh, which is a great uh, Easter present for dad. You know, it, it's interesting, my wife and I, uh, she, she deals with some designing real estate stuff. So we're apart about half the year and it really works in our relationship because I'm annoying and she needs breaks from me. But um, one of my favorite presents, John, thinking of Easter, it, one of my favorite presents is finding a documentary I like. And this morning I stumbled upon one on Apple TV about Steve Martin. Now I think generationally, he's not in your wheelhouse. So I grew a up before like, my little before my time. My dad so loved him. Yeah. Yeah. So there's about six comedians in my life that I think kind of shaped how I looked at comedy. Carson, Albert Brooks, Gary Shandling, Steve Martin, probably Letterman. Uh, I mean, a lot of brilliant guys out there. Jerry Seinfeld later, Ricky Gervais, I think is laugh out loud funny, uh, Chris Rock. But uh, I want to say this for people out there. I'm I'm documentaries are my kind of favorite thing to do. Like I work out every day. Obviously, time with my wife, my kids, you know, career. Uh, for you, it could be hitting golf balls. Everybody's got this thing that just genuinely every day makes them happy. So my gift today on Easter was finding a Steve Martin, Apple TV, two-part documentary, a lot of Martin Short in the second one, a lot about his career I knew, a lot I didn't. If I said you on Easter, somebody could give you a surprise present, something that makes you happy every single time for two hours, what is it? I would say it would be food. Uh, we're having a lot of people over, and I have the I, I have the prime rib I just put on the smoker. I, I've never done this before, Colin. I, I feel tangible pressure on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> we have friends, you know, their families. They live in different states. They're all coming over here. If I mess up this meat, no, no one's going to remember the mac and cheese or the bread. But if the prime rib is not done right, uh, th they'll never forget that. And you know, it's uh, one another thing I found out: prime rib isn't cheap. So I. The older you get, you realize, you know, I used to have my mom or dad, they, they'd all cook. I didn't have to do anything. I just got to sit there, watch the Elite Eight, hang out. The older, you know, you take on those responsibilities. Uh, this might be my last time. We'll see. But uh, I, I, I just put it on the smoker here, Colin. So we will, in about three hours, see how that bad boy tastes. But yeah, in, all tell, in all seriousness, mm -hmm. you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty simple. I'm a lot like you, I think. Pretty simple. I, I don't do much. I work. I, I try to work out every day. Uh, you know, I, I golf a couple times a week. I mean, that's kind of the extent of my life. I'm with my girlfriend a lot. I, you know, my friend group is kind of gets smaller as you get older. I, I, yeah. I really just don't do that much. I mean, I, obviously, I watch a lot of sports, uh, but uh, other than that, my, my life is real. I, I don't need much to be happy. You know, and people ask me all the time for advice. I make more money now than I ever have, but early on in my twenties, when I worked in football, and even when I first got into radio. It was never, I never even thought about money and being around football coaches. When I got, when I went to work for Pat Hill, he was one of the first million dollar uh, non power five coaches. And obviously, Andy is, was at well into the millions by the time I met him. You never felt like their passion for their sport and their love. And they, that's why when you do what you like, it's easier to work more. And, and I think your life becomes a little more simple. You don't need all these other, um, you know, auxiliary things on the outside that you're constantly chasing for happiness. Your, your work kind of brings you happiness. Yeah. I tell my kids all the time, uh, gratitude is a great gift. Some people have it. Some don't. I, my mom was a nurse very, very early. I don't remember my mom being a nurse. It was right. And you know, she probably stopped when I was about six, but she used to always say, I've seen people in chronic pain. If you have your health and that my mom was always way ahead of her time with food. I never ate a piece of white bread in my childhood. Like my mom was very much into. We were the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, I think a lot of it was she saw, she saw bad diets, the repercussions of not eating right. So my mom was always uh, grateful for her health and she passed that along. And I tell my kids this all the time. You got good genetics. We don't have the big C in our family. You know, we don't have a lot of cancer in our family. We don't have a lot of depression in our family. Like, so here on Easter, uh, I'm grateful for a lot of things. And one of them is a great documentary. 
our friendship, friendships. My, I have pruned my tree like you over the course of time. You have a handful, 20 people in your life that really matter. You're certainly one of them. You've been a wonderful part of the volume, and uh, I love watching you grow. One other thing before we get into football, I was watching this with UConn. It's, they're a fascinating program. They're going to win this championship. If so, they'll be tied for the third most, more than Kansas. You know, I mean, Michigan football's had two natties since like 1950, and it's a huge brand. UConn is the greatest program in the history of college sports, men, women, baseball, football, basketball, women's basketball, nobody ever talks about. They're going to have six different titles if they win this one. And I'm watching them the other night, and I'm like, I don't know exactly why this is. Because, by the way, they're the biggest college basketball program in the Northeast now, which is where all the main media is. But think about the biggest basketball programs ever. UCLA, Kentucky, Kansas. Think about the biggest bas football programs. Notre Dame, Michigan, Ohio State, USC, Texas, Oklahoma. There is something weird about UConn that the state doesn't have any players. They're going to win a six national championship, and they're never a national story. And is it because they've had downturns? It's been three different coaches instead of just one great iconic coach, although I think Jim Calhoun is the Bill Snyder of college sports. Like, you know, just never got the credit he deserved. But it is so weird to me watching UConn kick everybody's ass. I think I talk about them twice a year. I'm to blame as much as anybody. And by the way, they're right down the road from ESPN. They, they're still never discussed. I, I think college football and college basketball parallel each other so much in terms of it's all about your coach. W when you get the right guy, obviously Jim Calhoun, when I was a kid, was you know a legendary figure in the sport. It does feel like Dan Hurley's thrown in his hat in the ring. Like, is he the new Kirby Smart of yeah. college basketball? Yeah. I'm always fascinated just because I... You know, when I got out of the NFL and I was close to the 49ers, the the brother dynamic. And obviously you watch Jim and John. I mean, Jim was this, I don't want to say superstar, but he played in the NFL for 15 years. He was way more famous than John, who starts as like a quality control guy. And then they both kind of end up at the same level. You saw Peyton and Eli. Peyton, infinitely more famous, way more MVPs. But for a while, Eli had the two Super Bowls. Peyton only had the one. You look at Bobby Hurley. I mean, one of the prominent figures, wouldn't you say, the last 30 years in in college sports in general, basketball yes. or football. Yes. I, I don't know. His brother clearly was not some star player, but, you know, Bobby's hanging on here for dear life at Arizona State, his, his coaching career. Now, you could argue this isn't a great job, but it's not going great. And this guy's becoming, I mean, he's got a long way to coach, catch like John Wooden or Coach K, but you start rattling off a couple early, you build that momentum. I mean, he is... He's a rock star. I mean, and it was they used to coach together for a split second. I mean, they're both kind of crazy. Does feel like Dan's calmed down a little bit, but they feel like, I mean, maybe Florida in its heyday in football or USC or Bama or a couple of those Florida basketball. Like, they're on a different level. I mean, you just want it's crazy. No, it reminded me watching them beat Illinois. And I mean, the second half, like, Illinois didn't score. They went on like a 32 nothing run. Yeah. And I thought to myself, this reminds me of Alabama with Saban year three to about year 13. And you're like, oh, they're like humiliating other really good programs. I mean, there was a run there for Alabama when they would have nine NFL first or second rounders on defense where, I mean, they they would just humiliate like, like high level SEC and Big Ten teams. And I kind of feel that with UConn, there's a grit. There's a, they always have NBA dudes. They're almost like uh, a Syracuse. When you watch them, you see the NBA length and talent. Um, but there's a fight. There's, there's a fight with UConn. Um, so, you know, just, just watching them discombobulate teams is something to behold. So, you know what, you know, what's fun. One thing I noticed yesterday watching Alabama, who is going to the first, I mean, they went to their first elite eight, let alone final four in program history. Is immediately I always Google the the coaching salary and he's making almost seven million dollars, <laughs> you know, at, at Alabama to coach basketball. And you know, I follow the sport of golf closely. Their golf team travels private. I mean, the power of that, even Clemson, and and I know they were an eleven seed, so it was a little bit of a Cinderella. But I, I don't think their basketball, the, the power of this football money infused into the basketball conferences. This is where you know UConn, everything when it broke away for football only, it was because the economics. 
right? It's why the Big Ten has no excuse to not be consistently. They, they feel like they haven't been as good at basketball these last couple of years. The right. money that's about to come in for them, I mean, we're looking. We're two or three years away from every basketball coach in those two conferences. Well over five million in the top dogs, not making maybe football coach money, but they're probably making you know seven, eight, and then obviously an ISO or something might make ten, eleven. But the, the money. Because of football, you know, they say a rising tide lifts all boats. That's clearly what it's done for the SEC in basketball. Well, and I also think, John, um, you know, a lot of people, I grew up with Pac-12 football, and there was a lot of uh, anger um, when the Pac-12 dissolved. But I had been saying this for eight or nine years to people, and, and my my buddies out west would push back. I'm like, guys, we have pro sports. We have beaches. We have moderate summer temperatures. We have mountains. It just doesn't matter as much here. In the south – you know, in the summer, you're inside watching Braves baseball. It's too damn hot to go outside. Yeah. In the fall and the winter, I mean, you go down to a convention, you go to a hotel in the South, it's all SEC hats. They were the last region to get pro sports. Uh, the Big 12s, too spread out, small towns, not a lot of media centers. Big eat small. I've seen it my entire life. The SEC and the Big 10 are going to control all the sports. We always sort of had this charade. We always sort of played this game to include everybody. But the reality is the big the, the, the Big Ten now has got the L.A. market, the Seattle market, Phil Knight, Michigan, Ohio State. It's going to separate from everybody except the SEC. And I do think it will get bigger than the SEC. Your point about basketball is fascinating because I watched Zach Eady take apart Gonzaga for the second time. And you know, I thought to myself, God, Purdue has been back to the Gene Cady days. They've been great forever. They just never can quite get there. But as I watch Zach Eady, I want to pivot to this. I thought years ago, there was this sense, you know, as a warrior guy, small ball. And you look back on it and it's a lot of nonsense. It was the Warriors and about 20 teams trying to be the Warriors, none could do it. Small ball was really Stephen Clay surpassing Gail Goodrich and West as the best shooting backcourt of all time. Everybody went, well, the game's, it's getting faster and you don't need size. And after about an eight-year run of small ball, when only the Warriors truly mastered it, Houston tried, a lot of people tried. Now the league's pivoting back to size. The big guys are dominating. And I'm watching Zach Eady and I'm thinking, isn't he worth 13 to 14 minutes a night somewhere? I know people tell me it doesn't work. I'm not asking him to defend the wing. I watch them and I'm like, Christ, Gonzaga can compete with everybody. They got shelled twice by him. I, I think the problem in basketball, and I think football follows this too, is when there's an outlier situation, you know, Draymond, who's going to be one of the great all-time small ball centers. He has arms the length of a seventh footer. It's a unique attribute he has, and he can do all this other stuff, right? And he doesn't need to score. So he's a defender who can run the point. I mean, he's Russell Wilson, all these small quarterbacks. No, I've, I've never really seen anything else like Russell Wilson. So if you keep drafting little guys, you're going to have some problems. And what happened? We've kind of pivoted away from that a little bit. Right. So I, I, I'm one, listen, I'm a Michael Jordan baby. It always bothers me when people you know, the younger generation, or even some older people that try to shit on the 90s. Obviously, Michael was the premier player. The majority of the great players were bigs. And if you think that David Robinson or Patrick Ewing in his prime or Shaquille O'Neal wouldn't annihilate 99% of these guys, you're great. Beside Embiid and Jokic, they'd have no shot. Even Anthony Davis, he is much slender. Now, he's a great athlete. He could hang. But even he's somewhat of an outlier athletically. So I, I'm with you. I think sometimes... If you've ever been to an NBA game, and I, when I was in radio, I used to go pregame a lot or an NFL game for pregame warmups. You want more big people than little people. <laughs> this isn't that complicated of a strategy. Yeah, George Young, the late great GM of the New York Giants, said, when in doubt, draft big. Even in guard play in the NBA, Luka, you, you can't really defend Luka. He's 6'8", 240. Yeah, I mean, it, LeBron is a three. Six, eight and a half, 250. He's a big three. Um, I, I, I just, I watched Zach Eady and I'm like, I've seen Gonzaga go toe to toe with everybody in college basketball for the last 15 years. Don't have to win titles. Villanova, Carolina, Duke, Kansas. I've seen them blow out teams. Zach Eady eats them alive. They have no answer for him. And it's like, 
No, I, I understand. Um, like there are certain quarterbacks. Tommy Frazier was not going to be an NFL yeah. quarterback. They just didn't throw the Charlie ball. Charlie Ward. I mean, there were some unique I, small. I games. get it. Yeah. But geez, seven four with a really nice touch. You can't tell me there's not a space for him somewhere in this freaking league. Well, if it was ninety six, he'd be the second pick in the draft, probably. <laughs> you know? So I'll never. When I first got to the NFL and some of those Coughlin Giants teams, you'd go out in warmups and you'd watch their defensive line, and you'd be like, "Who are these human beings?" And obviously, because of that defensive line, they won a couple Super Bowls. So yeah. when you can be the, the Warriors had Steph Clay and Kevin Durant, like you said, using them as like, oh, small ball, all time outlier situation, <laughs> right? We're we're never seeing that again, right? The history of the league is mostly big wings or a dominant center, and I think everything's cyclical. And back to the quarterback thing, look at the first quarterbacks that are going to go. Caleb, relative to some of these guys recently, a Kyler Murray or Bryce Young. Looks like a giant, right? right? And then Drake May, Jaden Daniels is big. Penix is big. Even Bo Nix, you around him, is thicker. He's not, I wouldn't consider him small. Uh, he's probably in that like Jimmy Garoppolo size range. But I, I just, I, I would lean to stay away from smaller players whenever possible. So high in a draft. I understand taking, you know, mid round. Yeah. The NFL draft is longer. But, you know, the Brock Purdy situation, again, outlier. That's not going to be the norm. You're not going to find starting quarterbacks in the fifth, sixth, seventh round. Yeah. Sean Payton told me he had sort of a rule. He said, you know, and he comes from the school of Bill Parcells. This was, let's just not draft undersized players at any position in the top 15, like Tua. Let's just exactly. not do that. Right. So we talk a lot about these quarterbacks. Um, and I have said before that I think Caleb Williams is the most talented, and like an Andrew Luck, he will succeed at some level, even if he got the wrong coach, GM, uh, O-line roster. And I do think Ryan Poles has had – he's redeemed himself. He's had a very good six to nine months. Yeah. So I think he may have the right – former offensive lineman, looks like the O-line. There's some hits there with his draft capital the last three years. But let's go – let's let's reverse the telescope. If I said to you – we know of these top five or six, two are not going to work. We know it right now. And I've said, I think Caleb's good enough to overcome. Everybody else will be as good as where they land. I think J.J. McCarthy in New England is a bust. I think J.J. McCarthy in Minnesota with that talent and coach, that division, which is light on defense, heavy on scoring, works. If I said to you, guess, give me two that if you had to put the odds on, it won't work. See, now I think Bo Nix is going to fall and end up falling to like a McVay or you know, a Peyton. You know, I kind of think Bo Nix is not talented enough to overcome, whereas I think Jaden Daniels isn't either, but is going to go top three or four, and that's problematic. So I would get Jaden Daniels to me is like, oh, no, I think he can succeed. But the top three quarterbacks are going to defensive coaches working with new OCs, three for three. So give me the guy that you worry about. Yeah, to me, he'd have to be first given, you know, I, I don't want to, it's unfair to compare him to a guy who's won two MVPs, but his, his game is parallel some of Lamar, yeah. right? He, he throws it pretty, he probably throws it better outside the hashes down the field. But I do think that type player early on in his career, Lamar went to the Ravens, who literally pivoted midseason, changed their whole offense around, it's not just one of the highest level, you know, sports teams, it's like one of the higher level businesses probably in America, the way they've operated for 20 plus years. So he got, I know it sucks falling to 32, but he got pretty lucky. Jane Daniels, that's probably not going to happen, right? He's going to go in the top five and more than likely you're not getting a competent operation. So if he goes to the New England Patriots, that's pretty scary. I mean, their offensive talent is a disaster. I Listen, I'm not trying to judge you on the coach's picture. But Gerard Mayo's wearing like a T-shirt. He looked disheveled. I know he's a high-level, impressive guy, but I, I, I don't know, man. I, and I, I'm saying that tongue in cheek, but in all seriousness, the drop-off that's about to come from Bill Belichick to what's going on. The Crafts refused to name a general manager. Elliot Wolf's kind of doing it. I think it's going to be a rough go for that so organization. Yeah. And then the JJ McCarthy. My comp for him is Alex Smith. Alex Smith had success when he had Jim Harbaugh and Andy Reid. One guy's basically a, a chubbier version of Bill Walsh, and Jim Harbaugh is one of the more successful college NFL coaches we've ever seen. When right. he had Mike Nolan and Mike Singletary, it was a disaster. They were chanting yep. for David Carr. So that that's very fickle, 
right? The, certain physical talents. Like Josh Allen probably would have succeeded no matter what, right? He's just right. physically too gifted. Even Herbert, even his down years ago, I still see a lot there. Two is a good example. Kind of like Jared Goff. Much less physical attributes when it's not going well. You're like, what the hell is this? Good coaching, good offensive weaponry, oh, good yeah. protection. You're Tua like, okay, and Goff. I see it. Yeah, Tua and Goff are very much about protection and coach. Herbert has gone to the playoffs and has yet to get even a remotely competent coach. And, and I would take Jared Goff all day over Tua just on the simple fact he's bigger. I, I think yeah. he just throws a better ball. Uh, and on the flip side, you know, I, I don't know if you saw all those numbers from Penix, but I, I we, you and I have talked about this before, a lot of comparisons to Tua, and then you see him run like a 4-5-5, five, five, and he jumps 37 inches. I think Kobe jumped 36. So I, I'm not comparing him as an athlete to Kobe Bryant, but it, he's a really good athlete. Yeah. I mean, that's – so I know you don't see it as much on film because he wasn't asked to play that way. They had – you know, I, I think they thought they had the best offensive line in the country. Then they met Michigan, but they had an excellent offensive line, right? So he wasn't getting touched. I think he was only sacked like what eleven times. So it's like averaging less than one a game. But he clearly can move, right? So you could get a guy in some of these Shanahan offenses or Sean Payton to get him on the move a little bit. He has it in him. I clearly his film as a pocket passer is pretty special. Questions with injuries that that that's scary. But I heard a podcast probably within the last six months of Dubor talking about when he first got to Indiana and they recruited him was he was recruited as more of a dual threat guy. And then he had yeah. the injuries and they just yeah. got away from it. But he physically, yeah. I I was pretty, that, that was an eye opening experience to see those. I would have guessed he's like a four, eight guy and yeah. not a great athlete, but he's not like Tua. remember he hurt his hip his last year in college. So he couldn't work out. He ain't running a four five. He ain't sniffing. No. And listen, two, two is a pocket quarterback, which I thought Penix was too, but you see these athletic numbers kind of like the C.J. Stroud. Now, he did it more on film in that Georgia game, but one thing we know about C.J., pocket quarterback, but has athletic attributes to kind of move around when shit hits the fan, which in the NFL it inevitably does. Yeah, I think J.J. McCarthy only works if he goes to, like, let's say, a Minnesota. I think that that's a furnished apartment for a young quarterback. Everything set up. You may don't have to pay rent for a year. Darnold's paying rent for a year. He'll take yeah. the hits and the bruises. Then you step in. What I about think the Giants? Penix, oh, I don't. I don't like anybody to the Giants. I don't like <laughs> anybody right now to the Giants. So it's a tough, tough landing spot. I, I would say Penix to my Miami to be the next Tua. Penix to Seattle works. I I think they're kind of ready to roll. His offensive coordinator. I think McCarthy in Minnesota works. Um, I tend but the to the Rams as Rams is a sleeper for him. Well, the Rams a sleeper for a lot of people. So they're one of those teams that has been very successful without first round picks. This is their first, first rounder in a long time. And they're at 19. I could see the Rams sliding down. If Bo Nix is there and you start, I've been in a war room before you have, and you slide down and you're like, well, the next four teams don't need quarterbacks. If it's, you know, at 19, you're getting into like Dallas may, but they need some pieces. I could see the Rams going and saying, we're going to take Bo Nix and he's going to sit for two years. I could totally see that happening. So I, I think Bo Nix to me, again, like a Penix, like a J.J. McCarthy, it's going to be the spot. But Bo Nix may be the luckiest of all because the truth is uh, if he goes, and I think he probably will, I think Denver is the last chance for him. Then there's going to be a long stretch of people that aren't going to move up. Like if you start looking at the teams that need quarterbacks, it's not a surprise. They're mostly in the top 12 and 13. That's why they're bad teams. Yeah. So I think Bo Nix, I think the Rams would roll the dice on Bo Nix because the Stetson Bennett didn't work. Stafford feels like he's hurt at least once to twice a year. That one's interesting. All right. The NBA season is in full swing coming down the stretch. Then we move right into the playoffs in April, May, and June. I can't wait. Spice things up with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA right now. All you have to do is put down 5 bucks and get $150 instantly in bonus bets. Pretty good trade-off. I pay 5 I get $150. North Carolina listeners, do not forget. Welcome to the party. DraftKings Sportsbook now live in your state, North Carolina. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Takes 90 seconds. The code is Colin, C-O-L-I-N. Again, 90 seconds. Download DraftKings Sportsbook app. Put in Colin. New customers bet five. Get 150 back in bonus bets instantly. That is the trade. 
All right. The code is always Colin. The crown is yours. So I, I, I want to talk about a, a move that you're well aware of. I was reading Ian O'Connor gave me you know, several chapters of his book on Aaron Rodgers. I'll just tell everybody, Ian is a relentless reporter. You get uh, background, the first chapter on Aaron's family, which is it's got a history of uh, World War II. It's just fascinating, fascinating. And, and it's master class storytelling. So I've read about four or five chapters. Um, I'm giving him a little blurb for this for his book. I could not put it down. I flew through it. So the first year, it was kind of like, let's get friends of Aaron, Nathaniel Hackett, Alan Lazard, uh, Randall Cobb. This offseason for the Jets, it's been like, let's just get some older players and let's go all in, Tyron Smith. So they get Hassan Reddick, who I think is a very good big play pass rusher. He tends to make his best plays in the biggest moment. Eagles got to get, you know, they're paying Jalen Hurts. They got to move off some salary. So I think Hassan Reddick has something in the tag, maybe a little bit of a Vaughn Miller here where there'll be moments you'll be like, oh yeah. And then you'll be like, he's old and he's not in his prime. But um, I do think it's interesting. The Hassan Reddick to me felt like, oh shit, this Aaron Rodgers thing, it not only has to work, it has to work by like October 15th or otherwise, I think you start losing the owner, the GM. I think you start losing people with Aaron, right? Like so much of the off field stuff, the book will come out with Ian O'Connor. And there's some parts that you look at it and you're like, boy, Aaron's a lot of work. So your take on the Reddick move and kind of where the jets are with this right now. Did I read on uh, the internet that, Ian said he worked for a long time and Aaron finally agreed to sit down with him. So he got him for he a did. couple hours. Yeah. Yeah. And Ian, Ian, now he's done the book on Belichick. Uh, his Mike Krzyzewski book is, God, it's good. Uh, the Belichick Captain, book's good. I've, I've, I listened to it, but it's good. Yeah. And, and so, and the, and I've only read like five chapters, but I mean, the first chapter, the storytelling is <laughs> insane. I don't even know yeah, how the you. hell Ian O'Connor gets it, but where, where are the jets with you right well, now? Well, I, I think, Let's let's use LeBron and the Lakers for an example. If the NBA salary cap was a little easier to maneuver, like the NFL, this offseason they would sign Clay Thompson, DeMar DeRozan. They would sign every old guy who has ever had any success in the NBA. They would do it immediately. And I think that's that, that used to happen in the NBA a lot, right? When I was a kid, these older teams kind of get together at the end of their prime. Happens a little bit in the NFL, but you kind of fall off a cliff so fa- bad. And guys can't kind of team up together because usually one guy gets his money here, one guy gets his money here. It does feel like they're great. I mean, one, they're clearly desperate. That's not even debatable. My take last week on that story that came out about Sala and Woody was like, unless you were standing there, no one knows what the hell was going on. But sometimes in life, perception becomes reality. And if that would have been like John Lynch was yelling at Jed York, you'd be like, no way, right? Or Sean McVay was arguing with Roger. Like, I don't believe that. But when it's the Jets, you're like, yeah, I could see that, right? right? 100%. Because Woody Johnson's reputation is pretty well established. Kind of a crazy guy to work for. Not yeah, an easy place. And, and the organization's you know win-loss record kind of speaks for itself. Everyone's entire job, like this whole group and era, uh, is all on the line. And at one point in time, well before Aaron, when they made that trade with Jamal Adams, it looked like they had a bright, bright future. And things change fast when you miss on the quarterback. They, they they really do. And they had to double down on the situation because they missed on Zach Wilson, made the Aaron trade. No one knew he would get hurt, but newsflash, 39-year-old guys sometimes get hurt in sports, right? Yeah. I, I hurt my back the other day working out. It wouldn't happen at 30 years old, but at 39, it still doesn't feel quite right. So it's right. it's not weird at all. And I I don't know. I mean, Mike Williams seems like a great guy, awesome player when he he's always hurt. Yeah, you know the the Reddick thing. The, the Eagles aren't just in the business of getting rid of talented guys. Like that's that one's a little weird. I get their contractual situation there, uh, but th- they just took the Jets' pass rusher, who's way younger, and then they traded him Reddick. Right? Who, who would you say is a better run organization when it comes to picking players and trading for guys? Right. I'd say the Eagles. So that that one, uh, that's kind of a weird transaction. Even though the Jets had nothing to do with Huff going over there, he was just a free agent. I, I just think most times, I, listen, I was with the Eagles of the Dream Team and all, some of these Ronnie Browns and Jason Babbins, old, old guys, 
you just age fast in the NFL. It's you're not a kicker or a punter. You're you're asked to explode, change direction, and the moment that starts slipping, injuries happen. The pressure that comes with New York, I I, I unless Aaron is playing at a top five level of quarterback, I, I don't see this team having any chance in hell. Yeah, and because there's think, too much noise around it. That's that's part of it in the NFL. That's really hard. Look at the Ravens. Like there's no. This year, once they got the Lamar situation figured out, this out, there was just no noise. They just played football. Even the Lions, they just played football. No noise. Even the Packers this year, it was bumpy because win loss record, but it was just like, oh, they're just normal football team playing away. Yeah, I I was telling somebody the other day, I was having a conversation with a athletic director in the country, and this person called me. Uh, a coach was leaving, um, under their watch, a major coach, and the advice I said is, um. And there's a little anxiety with that. You have to hire a new coach. And and one of the things I said is whenever there's a divorce, you just have to realize that, uh, you know, your wife could end up marrying George Clooney. You have to, if you're going to get a divorce, think long and hard about it. It's going to disrupt kids. It's going to disrupt your business. Like if you get a divorce from a top employee as you own a company or, or you know, your wife, you and your wife split. You have to be comfortable with that person succeeding. And I told the athletic director that coach could go, you know, undefeated next year. When Favre left, he had about two good years left. And and then Favre's personality, a little bit of a gunslinger on and off the field, got him in a little trouble. And then Aaron, by that time, had established it. And and when Aaron left, Green Bay was sitting there thinking, yeah, for two years, we're going to have to eat it. Peyton Manning leaves the Colts, goes to Denver. You got to kind of eat it for two years and be comfortable with it. But Andrew Luck, pretty quickly, everybody went, oh, yeah, I get it. Aaron, pretty quickly with Favre, I get it. What's interesting, I thought Jordan Love, by Thanksgiving of the first year, it was like, and I and I really believe this, is he better than Aaron right now? He way more athletic. 100%. Like, there's not, there's not, not a even, GM in the NFL that would, obviously you factor in age, but I, I, he was Ben, Aaron didn't play well the year before for the Packers. And I, and I sat there and I thought this, that doesn't help Aaron. Like it did help Aaron when, when Favre kind of dovetailed, it's like we made the right move. Right. And it does help when, when Peyton Manning got hurt in Denver, you're like, yeah, luck was the right move. Shit, Jordan loves better right now. And I don't think that's a hot take. No, I I don't have the Minnesota Vikings 08 roster off the top of my head, but I remember being pretty good. The one for that year they had. They had yes, offensive they were linemen. Great. Adrian Peterson, I think, was young on that team. They had they a tight end. They had multiple wide receivers. Should have gone to the, the Super defense. Bowl. Yeah, yeah, the defense was good. That roster, I, I bet if we went player for player compared to this Jets, not even remotely the same. Obviously, Favre had that one last throwback year. I, I had a DM the other day that I was like, I hadn't really thought about that. He's like, everyone's mocking either a wide receiver or the tight end to the Jets, right? Get a little more offensive firepower, especially someone young. And they're like, Aaron doesn't like young players at that position. He's got that hit. Tom Brady was a same. They don't mess. They do not throw him the ball. So you draft Brock Bowers or you draft Roma Dunze. Well, if he doesn't, if they're not on the exact, that's why he likes Randall Cobb, Right. That's why he always pounded the table for James Jones, the wide receivers he likes. He really likes Devontae. He trusts them implicitly. Young players, it's a lot going on. So that's that's something to keep an eye on who they end up drafting high. Because if it is a skill guy, and maybe you'd say, well, they just signed Mike Williams. They don't need it as much. Well, I, I don't know if Mike Williams is the most dependable I- individual going at that position. So I, I just think the Robert Sala thing, he's a really good guy. He's easy to root for. But sometimes you just go to an organization like maybe it's just not it's in borderline impossible there to win right now with the way Woody is and and the Johnson family. I'm not absolving like Robert, some dynamic coach so far, and it all gets back to the Zach. I mean, this this Aaron story dates back to the Rogers or the Zach Wilson pick, because if they had hit on that now, you could argue that after Trevor Lawrence, they all, you know, are on different teams. Right. I, I think Woody came out and said at the owners meetings, this, this is a great uh, you know, tell sign of a uh, organization where it's like, what is this guy saying? If we can't trade him, because no one's trading for his eight million dollars as a backup quarterback, he will be on the team. It's like, oh, what, what, why wouldn't Woody just go, hey, this is their job? 
I stay out of it. That's what most owners do. That's why most owners don't talk that often, right? They, they just, it just makes it more complicated. They don't really have a choice at the owners' meetings. They kind of throw the local guys a bone. But for the most part, they never say anything because the moment they say something, that's the headline. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm just betting against the Jets. I really am. You know, I, I was thinking about this. Um, John Lynch is very liked. I covered him as a player. He's a great guy as a broadcaster uh, and as a GM. But it is interesting. Now, Brock Purdy's obviously, that goes on the tombstone. <laughs> you know, he got him in seventh. But I was thinking about this the other day is that San Francisco, the Niners are fascinating. Missed on Trey Lance, missed on Gray, the SMU receiver. Uh, they've missed on two third round running backs. Is that Kyle tends to they make have not, a lot. They have not drafted well recently at all. And it's like Kyle makes a lot of stuff work. And, and I was thinking about you on this. If I was now Les Sneed last year hit on multiple defensive players. So, you know, multiple guys, then he hits on Puka. And then he, the offensive lineman out of TCU we knew was going to be good. But I was thinking about this in the NFL. So Ryan Poles played offense, but he's got a defensive coach. So you can argue Ryan knows offensive personnel better. You know, he should draft offensive linemen. He was one. And I thought to myself, Lynch has had so many misses, and Shanahan makes virtually everything work offensively that – I, uh, do you have ever situations in the NFL where a GM, like I think to myself, I'm a GM. What is my coach's specialty? I'm going to hit on a much higher percentage of my draft picks, like McVay and running backs, McVay and receiver. He makes two, two at well work. Now he was a bust. McVay has saved a lot of, Les needs misses. Now, Les hasn't had a ton of them, but he's had a couple. And when you don't have first round picks and a second rounder's a miss, Logan Bruss, Wisconsin guard, 2 2 Atwell, you're not getting players to the third round. Do you think in the NFL that there are GMs that literally to elevate their stature or protect their job, that they are drafting? on sure bets based on the coach? Uh, I, I think the good teams don't think like that. I mean, John was rich well before he signed up to be the Niners GM, and now he's probably a top two or three high-paid GM. He's got multiple contract extensions. I, I don't I don't think he's worried about that crap at all. I, I think sometimes when you come up maybe less early on in his career, I mean, this was his life, right? A scout or a guy like that. They know this is their one shot. I mean, if John had failed at it, he'd go right back to broadcasting. And like I said, he right. was already a multimillionaire as, as a player. I, I think sometimes, I always defended this because I saw it with Trent Baalke, is when they had a couple years of building the great Niner team before Harbaugh got there, and he McLuhan was kind of the GM, but he was his right-hand guy. It is a lot easier to draft when you suck because <laughs> you don't just draft, if I have the fourth pick, look at the Rams last year. I know they didn't have their first-round pick, right, because Detroit had it. But they had a high pick in every round after that. And when you win, like they have this year, or, or the Niners or the Ravens, you're picking at the end of the round. So the pressure on that pick, your pool of picking people is just smaller, right? It'd be like any company trying to hire a group of 20 people. Well, you can't get the pool of the top 20 people. What if I removed 14 of those people and the people that other companies in your industry thought were the best? So you only have the pool of six. It just makes it more difficult. And the Niners, because of the Trey Lance trade, obviously didn't have high picks. And then they weren't picking to the second and third round. I mean, a lot of their picks have come with these like diversity hires. They've gotten these comp picks and they've, yeah. they've whiffed on a lot. And sometimes I think the Kinlaw example is good. Their first ever draft pick, they took Solomon Thomas. Didn't who work. Didn't okay. work. He, he, but he's still in the NFL, right? He's just a solid yeah. player. He probably should have been like a second or third round pick, but he was drafted... But a lot of it was super high character, super hard worker. And that's why he is still going to be in, he's going to have a 10 year career. But it was, it, it wasn't a high ceiling guy. Kinlaw's the opposite. A lot of questions, but holy shit, you see him, you see the flashes, and then they whiffed on both. And you start kind of Nick Bosa, you, my mom, my neighbor, anyone can pick that. The, the other picks are difficult. So, and, and your previous misses impact and your roster. 
right? It was a lot harder to make the Rams three or four years ago. It was difficult. It's why they could justify, we'll get rid of a first-round pick, get Jalen Ramsey, get Vaughn Miller. Like, we, we don't have room on the roster. Well, this year, they, they had a ton of room. They needed those picks. Right now, the 49ers, these last couple, it's been difficult. It hasn't helped, and I think you saw the depth in the Super Bowl. Chiefs just had more depth. Well, the Chiefs, well, the Niners gave away first-round picks. The Chiefs actually inherited some because they got rid of Tyree Kill. So they just had, and they hit on more picks. So that depth, it could just be a player here or two. Obviously, yeah. it helps having Patrick Mahomes, but I, I, I think that you obviously, the other thing is Kyle's the boss. You know, I, I think a lot of these organizations, the head coach, once he's, if he wants to, like, I want this guy. Now, they have a good relationship, just like a lot of teams with powerful head coaches. But the, the GMs will tell you off the record, you know, I don't always get to do what I want to do. That's so right. you just got to capitulate to your coaching staff. And, and it's not even just the head coach. It's the assistants. The assistants have takes, Colin. It'd be like if everyone had a podcast in the coaching staff, well, their podcast gets listened to by the head coach, not the personnel people. So he's like, oh, well, my guy wants this. And you just kind of trust him a little bit more than maybe your area scout or your college director. They have that's an underrated part about the NFL is the assistant coach's impact on a draft because they streamline right to the head man. If they like a guy through the head coach, you want that you want your assistant coach to like him and believe in him, especially when you have a high level of trust in that assistant. So that's that's where things can get a little wonky. <laughs> Right around this time, really, these next three weeks are where a lot of the boards getting set. Assistant coaches are flying in with takes out of left field. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden we had a guy in the fifth round and he thinks we should take him in the top 50. I mean, because he knows his dad or he loved him as a player or he's tight. He's a college teammate of the guy's position coach at Alabama or USC. This is when things start getting really weird. And most teams, their meetings start this week. So buckle up, personnel people. Well, I always feel um, over the, and I've been like you, I've loved the draft forever, but you are a professional scout. I always feel there's like about two players per draft that can't miss. So take out quarterbacks, take quarterbacks out because they are very dependent on where they land. But a guy can rush the passer or he can't. A guy can, a guy can catch or he can't. This draft does feel like to me, it's got about five guys I don't see Marvin Harrison Jr. missing. I think he's just yeah. – I don't think Brock Bowers is missing. Joe Alt, um, those guys jump out to me. Is the kid at Oregon State the right tackle who – like you can't find bad tape on him. It does feel like this draft um, – but like the – there are players in this draft. I think sometimes receivers can be very dependent on the environment Big and the quarterback. Uh, quarterbacks are very dependent on several people, including the play caller. But if I said to you, two guys in the draft as a former scout, because I always thought Patrick Willis, the Ole Miss linebacker, I was told by a GM, 32 teams he'd work for. Uh, I was told Aiden Hutchison out of Michigan, like that's going to work. Um, I'm trying to think of somebody else. Calvin Johnson was yeah, going Larry to work. Larry Fitzgerald, Julio Jones. I mean, there's right. certain guys. That, you know. They're going to work. Is it? Give me the two guys here. Let's say they go to a lousy situation. You cannot see failing. Well, I don't see how it's possible for a kid from Napa, California, to go to the best program in the country of Georgia. And Brock Bowers, I would say, pretty immediately as a freshman, in yeah. the, definitely the most athletic conference in the country, was one of their best players. And, and by year two or three, he's arguably the best player in the country, pound for pound, as good Maybe as the anybody. Best, most productive tight end I've ever seen in college. <laughs> so you get this guy that goes, it, it would have been easy for a West Coast guy, go to Oregon, go to USC, even in Oklahoma or Texas, not go. He went all the way to where the pressure was brightest and dominated. I, I don't see, and I know there's some comparisons, doesn't really block. Well, the game's changed a lot. We have a lot more of these hybrid tight ends, a lot more of the Travis Kelsey style. He's very like any receiver dependent on a quarterback to throw him the ball, obviously. But how's he not going to be a good NFL pro? I, I saw some of his measurables. They put right next to Laporta, very similar size. A uh, little harder to judge, I think, sometimes those Big Ten tight ends because you're like, well, who's he, you know, defenders he playing against? There's no debate. Think about the guys he went and practiced against, Colin. If I was a scout, I wouldn't even need to watch game tape. I'd be like, can I just get your Georgia practice tape from a year ago? <laughs> your entire draft when the you know the 11 guys on defense went? Uh, so I think they had 18 guys on defense go over a two-year span. I, I can imagine Kirby's like, yeah, we couldn't cover them there either. 
So yeah. I, I I don't see how it's possible. The I was texting about sometimes height at tackle. Like there's six six, like a Trent Williams, uh, Jason Peters. I, I think uh, Lane Johnson six five. Like six eight, six nine can get a little tall because Vaughn Miller or Nick Bosa, these guys where they are to the ground, it's just hard to touch them. But from yeah. what I've heard about Joe Alt, it's just his athleticism. Uh, I just don't see how he's not going to be good. Now the one thing with him. Because I was texting, I was like, should the Chargers, if they get stuck, just take them? They're like, well, you already got the left tackle. Just get a touchdown guy for Herbert. You can get a right tackle maybe in the second round. You, you've yeah. already got that position. You don't need to force it. If you do get stuck there, just take whoever you think the best skill guy is, and there are some talented guys. And I, most people believe the three wide receivers. And you and I talked about I saw James Jones, which I understand a lot of the players are like, God, it's bullshit. Marvin Harrison isn't doing anything. When all the other guys worked out all the quarterbacks, all the wide receivers. I heard neighbors at the LSU Pro Day, which I don't know if you saw some pictures. That thing was a zoo of NFL people. Yeah. I was like, okay, Marvin, watch this. Because he you know, he thinks he's going to go number one. I defend Marvin in the sense he, he's, everything he's doing is because his dad's telling him. And when your dad's yeah. in the Hall of Fame, if he tells you to jump, you say how high. So I, it's like I don't believe it's his own choice. I'm not saying he's not agreeing to it, but what's he supposed to do? Tell his dad he doesn't know what he's talking about? You're right. But that, that neighbor's... Connie ran a four three. He's a fantastic tape. I mean, dominated in the SEC. Ran a four three five and jumped forty two inches. I mean, pretty rare athlete. So I, I you know, it's hard. I, I don't know what to gauge on Harbaugh. I think I said you and I talked about this last week about the wide receivers, and someone hit me up like the Ravens have taken wide receivers over the years. Yeah, in the twenties when they're good, when they've drafted yeah. high, it's Lodi Nada, it's Ronnie Stanley. Yeah. Now that I don't know if that guy's really here, right? There's not a great pass rusher in this. The Bama guy, I don't think he's viewed as a top ten player. Like we no. talked about, they don't need a left tackle. You could, I guess, take the Oregon State guy there. Probably be a little rich, but I, I don't know. You know, if Harbaugh didn't take Marvin Harrison, he's seen him back to back years, right? And seen him on cross film for three years at yeah. Michigan. That'd be a little interesting. Neighbors is from what you know. I think he's had some incidents over the years, but. His right. talent, I think they feel he's pretty buttoned up right now. Rome honestly feels kind of like a Harbaugh guy. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I think the Chargers are fascinating. But yeah, I would go Brock Bowers. I, I don't see how he's not. If you got if you gave him a if you just put him on the Chargers, which I don't think, you know, that he would immediately make like nine, ten, you know, ish million dollars in a tight end. The franchise tax twelve. So ideally taking a tight end that high, you're already paying yeah. him premium money. But I think he'd be a premium player immediately. I, I think he would well, dominate. If you told me Brock yeah. Bowers is on the Chargers next year, I'd be like, he catches 88 balls. Wouldn't you? Nine touchdowns. I mean, yeah. here's the other thing. Letting Gerald Everett go to the Bears, they don't have – I mean, they're 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 well below average in the NFL at tight end. And so – and Herbert, I mean, can you imagine him having a 6'6 target? You know, because he was so – he's been so effective with Keenan Allen and – Mike Williams. I mean, it, so he he's one of those guys that will throw guys open. A lot of young quarterbacks don't. He no. thro he throws young guys open. All right. So, you know, we kind of get ready. You know, I was um it's interesting. I as I get older, you know, I uh I I used to hate to take time off. I just didn't like to do it. Um maybe it was some insecurity. But as I've gotten older, I like to travel with my kids. I like to travel with my wife. And so I was talking to my son today about going. Uh, we went to Iceland last year. It had an absolute ball. He doesn't like heat. He likes cold. So we're going to go to Ireland here in a couple of years, maybe this year. And in the summer, you know, I'm kind of fighting to get my staff time off. And I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get some time off. I love to go to the Northeast in the summer, which is uh, Nantucket. Uh, I've been to Hamptons twice, but it's not my favorite. I have a place in Rhode Island. So if I said to you, John, because you live in Arizona and it's hot, I said, okay, you can take your beautiful girlfriend, you get 10 days, it's paid. And everybody now we're moving into spring. You know, golf vacations, I'm gonna go, I'm not gonna play golf in Ireland. I'm gonna go to the castles and Dublin, that kind of stuff. You and your girlfriend, 10 days, all expenses paid. Where is your summer vacation? Well, she's on me right now, Colin, because I, I think I can relate to your younger self. I I, I could just we got this thing rolling. We got momentum. I, you know, I, I'm not a big take things off. I don't like being away. Now, obviously, even in the month of July for football, it slows down. But I, I could find a way to do podcasts. She likes to travel a lot. 
And, you know, that's one area we butted heads because I'm working. Uh, now, I can also take this with me, so I don't really have an excuse. This isn't 1997. I, right. I don't have an excuse if I want to. We looked yesterday pretty closely at Costa Rica. Oh, uh, it's nice. It looks pretty beautiful. She wants to go somewhere to the beach. Uh, her mom, a couple years ago, her, her dad had passed, and fi- they, she bought a condo in Tahoe so we can go up there. But she, you know, we've both been going to Tahoe most of our life, which is awesome in the in the summer. But something that we haven't done. We we looked a little at the Bahamas. Uh, I've never been to either. Uh, hell, I've never even been to Cabo. Uh, but she she kind of on me about Costa Rica, so we looked pretty closely yesterday, and that feels like where we might end up sometime in July. Yeah, I I don't. My dad later in his life went to Russia and he went to Egypt. Um, and so my dad, you know, it was a different way to travel back then. But it, it is weird when you look back at your parents and how they you you become your a, a hopefully a you know a better version of your parents or uh you know a more aware version of your parents. I mean, there's we're all a little self-consumed now just because of yeah. social media. But it's my dad traveled a lot and I always enjoy traveling on my turns, but I I've I've gotten a travel bug here. Maybe it's because my wife is such a great travel partner. She's funny. She loves food. Her son's a chef, so he gives us all the places to eat. But I got to tell you, my son chose Iceland a year ago. I said, choose anywhere in the world. We're going to go in May. He chose Iceland. I had so much damn fun. And by the way, I was cold the entire vacation. (laughs) (laughs) Volcanoes waterfalls uh he he and i like we talk about it like every third time we talk we're like god i miss iceland so i think i'm gonna go to iceland for a day or two then into ireland and that'll be it my dad and his dad was uh was a big fly fisherman loved to fly fish yeah and when i was a kid his dad used to take him for about 10 to 15 days to new zealand and they did it my entire life up until my, my grandpa got really old and wasn't able to do it. And they, my, my grandpa had taught at Cal and he, he was an academic, but he was a big, I don't even know how he would fit in nowadays, big hunter and fisherman, big outdoorsman. Yeah. And he befriended like one of the main guides there. So these guys would always take care of him. And when I was 12 years old, you know, this was a different, my, my dad would, it's like the family went, it's just those two. Went. Right. And I got to go in, in sixth grade, fly to New Zealand by myself and I still have a picture. I mean, it, it was, and I told him, I said, bungee jumping was invented there. The first place bungee jumping ever happened. So I was like, dad, I'll do it. Let's drive there. So he rented a car. We had to drive three hours. I forget the city. We were, maybe it was in Auckland. And when I got there, you had to be 13. You had to sign a waiver. And you know, this is in the nineties. There's not like IDs or anything. And I was like, I'm going to do it. And then we kind of walk and we get to the spot where I'm going to do I'm like, I'm 12 years old. I'm 12 years old. I can't do it. And I, I ran <laughs> away. It was, but it, the, 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 it's one of the most, it's gotta be one of the most beautiful places in the world. I mean, Jurassic park, you know, film there. It's just, it's, if you like the outdoors, there's not much to do that. I remember, I mean, it's pretty mellow. Yeah. I wouldn't say Island vibes cause it can be a little colder, but it's just, it's a mellow, just absolutely gorgeous. At least in my experience, it's why he liked going there. So it's a long trap. I mean, you're coming from California. It's, I think it's like 17 hours. <laughs> Years ago, I was, I had a, I had an Australian bug and, uh, and I remember asking Lachlan Murdoch, Rupert's son, who now runs Fox, uh, about, uh, uh, I think he invited me either to a fight or to a party at his house. And I said, you know, I've, I've always wanted to go there. He goes, you live in Manhattan beach. It's the same thing. <laughs> he goes, it's, it's the same weather. He goes, <laughs> you know, it's a bigger city. He goes, there's a million places to go. He goes, I love Australia. It's amazing. But he goes, Manhattan beach is like 65, 70% of it. And I was like, all right, that's a guy that's traveled everywhere in the world. I will tell you, have you done Italy yet? Uh, I did it when I was in my early twenties, but yeah, I did Chingaterre. I did Rome. It's a, it's a powerful place. Rome was, wow. Rome was really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Florence, Rome, uh, yeah. Sicily powerful is a great way. To I would, it. I would go, I would go back there again and I, I will in a heartbeat. I, I thought that was, I did Spain. I'm not, Spain wasn't as much for, I was partying and it was cool for that. I, I wouldn't need to go back. I would, I could move to Italy. It feels like. I mean, it's well, it's, I, it's pretty awesome. I told my wife, I said I would have, and I can be a little impulsive on stuff like this, but I said I would have no problem in retirement going and living in Italy for. Um, I'd want to be out of there by like 
June 15th. They don't have air conditioning as well. It's as swampy. Here. It's swampy. And I said, but if you told me mid-February to mid-June, it, 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 whenever I retire, and I'm not retiring late. I'm, it, uh, you know, I'm not working until I'm 75. I said, yeah. I'd have no problem. Florence is a walking city. I lost seven pounds in Florence, and all I did was eat pasta and pizza. Well, you're, you're always on your feet. That's the thing. And you, you go to Europe, and you go, God, I'm eating a lot, and you feel lighter. That's they, they, their motor. I mean, we never go anywhere without hopping in a car. <laughs> like, also, their stuff. Avoid walking at, at all costs. Their food doesn't have the preservatives that we no, have. That, so that's, that's true. Too. Much cleaner. All right. John Middlecoff, former NFL scout. Go Lowe's, his golf podcast. Three and out the football podcast. Happy Easter. Hope you had a great one. And uh, we'll talk next week, buddy. Happy Easter, Colin. Talk to you soon.